The flightless Desert Wyvern Diabolos is one of the most widely used monsters in the series, being one of the original monsters to make the cut with the roster reshuffles before Tri and World respectively, as well as returning in a few weeks to menace hunters in the sandy plains of Monster Hunter Rise. People who started the series after first gen, which is most of the fanbase really, may not know that Diabolos' career in the franchise started effectively as an add-on. Monoblos is the original King of the Desert, the final boss of the first game, and the nemesis of the Hunters of Kotoko. Only after forging a piece of its armour do you unlock Diabolos. These two wyverns are obviously closely related, both burrowing denizens of the deserts of the Old World, with Diabolos also being present in the arid area of the New World known as the Wild Spire Waste. But how do such similar wyverns share the same environment? What caused the differences in their headgear and how does that affect their ecology? And what's the deal with Black Diablos? Let's delve into our natural world to try and answer some of these questions. First off, there's one aspect of their differing headgear that ripples out to become the main thing responsible for much of the differences between these two. But it's not actually the horns. It's the mouth. We know Diablos primarily eats cacti, and it has to be said he has quite a bizarre mouth. Its dentition just seems to consist of incisors and canines with a hard ridged palate and then no molars or any real form of cheek teeth. Weird mouths aren't that unusual among herbivores. For instance, ruminants have no incisors on their top jaw due to their specialised grazing, instead having a tough pad there. This seems to suggest that Diablos doesn't just primarily eat cacti, it's a cacti specialist. It's not a matter of preference, it's dependent on large, soft-bodied desert plants like cacti and euphorbias, as its bizarre dentition can't tackle much else. Diablos may get around the spines just with sheer size, its tough palate and using the front teeth to break it up first. Or like cuckoos that eat spiny caterpillars, it may also just gulp down the spines whole and then regurgitate them as a mass later. Monoblos, on the other hand, has a mouth much more recognisable to that of a ceratopsian dinosaur, quite obviously being based on a Styracosaurus. Ceratopsians were hypothesised to eat various tough plant species, and whilst this has varied a bit depending on the various families, Centrosaurines, which is the family Styracosaurus belongs to, seems to have some adaptations to deal with tough, fibrous plant matter. Even with Daimyo Hermitors, we never really get a good look at inside Monoblos' mouth, as any teeth it may have had could have fallen out. But they do seem to have teeth sockets, so for the purposes of this video, I like to assume that they share similar teeth to the dinosaurs that they were based on. From both real life and various desert maps in the game, we see that the deserts have shrubs, palms, cycad-like plants, and even a handful of trees. The arid area of the land known as the Everwood even seems to border on dry savanna woodland, as does the sandy plains. Monoblos likely eats the tougher, woodier vegetation in such areas, shearing through it with their strong beaks before slicing it into a digestible pulp. This difference in resource use to reduce competition between similar species is called niche partitioning. The two wyverns may well be the same genus, and almost certainly share a common ancestor before the two split into their separate roles with their differences in diet being a key factor in causing the differences in their ecology. As the final part of discussing their diet, Capcom also insists on repeatedly referring to the Vloss Wyverns as hunting prey. Whilst canonically making them herbivores, it seems both species may occasionally indulge in carnivory, and this isn't actually that rare in herbivores. Hippos will eat meat with surprising regularity, especially when nutritionally stressed, and various species of deer will quite often eat ground-nesting birds too. The primary reason for this is to get vitamins and minerals, as their plant diet is otherwise lacking. For our wyverns, it's hard to think of a more nutritionally stressed environment than a literal desert, so it doesn't seem unreasonable that these giant wyverns occasionally eat smaller animals. Their huge bodies will require a certain amount of nutrients plants may not provide them in lean seasons, and the mineral cost of growing such enormous horns and spikes will no doubt play a part too. With this said, a lot of instances believed by eyewitnesses to be predation may also just be the intolerance of Bloss Wyverns to potential predators, that we'll discuss in a bit. It'll come as no surprise that giant animals need a lot of food. But how much time may the giant desert wyverns need for feeding? Looking at modern herbivores, there's quite a lot of variables as to how much foraging you do and how much food you need. Surprisingly, the bigger you are, the better you can handle both a consistent diet of poor quality food and long periods without it. But despite this, bigger animals still spend more time foraging. This is likely due to the vegetation and mouth structure. 
Modern giant herbivores still spend between 50 and 80% of their time foraging, so let's assume something similar for the Bloss wyverns. Overall, the bulk of their time is spent eating or searching for food. Before the negatives begin, one thing Bloss wyverns have in their favour is they have quite a large mouth for their body size. Diablos especially, and considering cacti don't really require much chewing, they may well be a more efficient feeder than most modern herbivores. The big downside Bloss wyverns suffer compared to them is they live in a much harsher environment than the study animals used. Elephants and black rhino will live in very harsh parts of Namibia, but there's not really much research on their daily time portions. The differences in daily time budgets that the Bloss wyverns make up for with efficient feeding may instead be spent on travelling between food patches. As a brief aside also, sleep probably isn't a big thing for them. There's a poorly understood relationship between increasing body size and a lack of need for sleep with elephants needing perhaps the least sleep of any large mammal. So let's assume the same for the Bloss wyverns. Due to the harsh environments they live in, the Bloss wyverns may spend much of their time travelling, and this may actually be the reason for their burrowing behaviour. Due to the long travel times between vegetation patches and the length of time needed for feeding, the giant Bloss wyverns may have no choice but to be active in the hot desert day. For such massive animals, this isn't easy. The bigger you are, the harder it is for you to shed excess heat due to having less surface area. When moving, the heat generated by your muscles is very hard to get rid of, and even more so with a searingly hot ambient temperature. Elephants are very vulnerable to this due to their lack of sweat glands and very compact shape. The Bloss wyverns may have some relief, as they're quite long animals which increases surface area, and they're also shown to pant and salivate profusely too. Some monobloss are also white, and this is likely a mutation that causes a lack of pigment as their horns are also white. Pale colours don't absorb as much heat, and so this mutation may remain in the population as it may even be a selective advantage to monobloss out in the midday sun, even if just a small one. Their major downside is that they're considerably more massive than elephants, with something like 25 tonnes being a conservative minimum for such a massive wyvern, compared to just 6 tonnes for a bull elephant. This may be why Bloss wyverns never actually lost their wings. Whilst useless for flying or digging, they still function as important radiators to shed heat from. In physiology, such things are called thermal windows, like an elephant's is. But even with these adaptations, it's likely continuous strenuous exercise in the heat of the day could prove fatal to a Bloss wyvern. This may actually be why the guild encourages daytime hunts of such wyverns. The constant strenuous harassment from the hunter's attacks could considerably shorten a fight with the heat stress, and this may also be why the Bloss wyverns flee. Not because they become scared, but because they're so heat exhausted they need to find a spot to cool down. With no choice but to be active in the hot daytime temperatures, this may well be the reason of why Bloss wyverns became diggers. To still move, but in a way that allows them to escape the baking desert sun. The large cavern in the Wildspire Waste apparently isn't natural, but is dug by Diablos. Over generations, Diablos may have carved huge tunnel networks in the desert soil, between sleeping caverns, vegetation patches, mineral licks, and water holes. The act of actually burrowing as constant movement would be quite energetically expensive, and it's likely mainly used for softer sands and also short-term ventures, like to pursue mates or competitors or to find new cactus patches. Both Bloss wyverns likely use their horn to break up rocks or dense soil in front of them, and then pushing themselves through it mainly with their forelimbs. Whilst on the surface, Bloss wyverns are primarily bipeds, when underground I'd imagine them being mainly quadrupedal, with the bulk of their forward movement being the wyvern pulling itself forward with its forelimbs, the hindlimbs being mainly used for stabilisation and compacting removed soil into the tunnel floor. This brings us to aspects of the Bloss Wyvern morphology. One thing I find quite noticeable is the shoulder hump present in both, likely caused by enlarged thoracic vertebrae. While some of this is raised shell, there's still a very definite hump here that puts me in mind of another large herbivore. That symbol of the American wilderness, the bison. In both animals, this hump likely serves a similar role, in that it's the muscle connection point on the vertebral spines for several key anatomical features. First is the nuchal ligament, the tendon that connects your skull to your spine and is the one responsible for holding your head up. Both Bloss wyverns have enormous skulls, with no fenestrae to lighten the load. Diablos has enormous horns, Monobloss has a large frill of solid bone. 
The neck support muscles in these two wyverns have to be enormous to support such giant structures, and it's no surprise the connection point is enlarged in the two for the load. It's also an important connection point for a lattice of muscles connecting the scapula and forelimb that allow for the main source of power and length in the strokes the forelimbs would make. For an animal having to burrow and push itself through dirt, a huge connection point for huge muscles would be needed here, as well as for allowing for a longer stroke for the limb for more efficient movements too. All in all, this adds up to a very powerful animal, just as bison are. It's worth noting the Blosswivens can charge at full speed, and then dead stop into a solid object with enough force to puncture solid rock. When you weigh well over 20 tons, the strength and resilience needed to not have your skull and neck completely crumple under this impact is immense, as is the force needed for them to launch themselves completely out of the ground using primarily just their forelimbs. Diablos also provides one of the most, if not one of the most impressive feats of strength in the series in absolute terms when it quite literally lifts an adult Glavinus and flings it over its shoulder. In comparison, a larger Devil Joe attempting to lift a smaller Diablos fails in the middle of the lift. Devil Joe doesn't actually slam dunk Diablos, its hind legs give out. The strength necessary for Diablos to successfully perform such a lift and then have the additional strength to throw another monster of that size is insane. Obviously the Blosswivens don't just fight other monsters with this strength and weaponry, they also fight each other. But with radically different horns, how does the shape of their conflict differ as well? Again, perhaps the most reasonable analogue for Diablos fights is Bison. There was one recent paper that sorted the ungulates into different types of fighters, but Diablos is much more like the wild cattle of today, in that their fights are primarily charges and pushing contests to display physical strength. Unlike various wild cattle though, Diablos horns aren't actually meant to double as lethal weapons. In Diablos contests, they are purely about strength. They're straight and they interlock, so Diablos can't reach around and also gore an opponent's throat with them. The reason for this may be that unlike bovids, female Diablos also partake in such contests when in estrus, being known as Black Diablos. Considering a Diablos cow in heat is the prize at the end of the fighting, it would be less than ideal if you could also kill her by accident due to the same horns that won you victory. But on this note, why are Black Diablos so aggressive, and why do they physically challenge their mates? Physiologically, some animals do undergo similar phenomenon, most notably elephants when they enter a period called must. This is the elephant equivalent of a rutting season, and is characterised by rises in various hormones, but chief of all testosterone. This unsurprisingly causes highly aggressive behaviour, with musk bulls dominating others and then getting access to the females. So black diablos are effectively gender-swapped musks. Diablos cows likely use this to filter through the males so they only get the largest and strongest ones, but they may also use it to keep other Diablos cows away too. Cacti is arguably a much rarer resource than the other vegetation that Monoblos can eat. Whilst it can grow in dense patches in certain areas, Diablos's specialisation likely means that there is less biomass available for it to eat in their shared habitats. This is likely one of the key things that spurred the differences in the horns between the two species of Blosswyvern. Indeed, the fact that Diablos cows have equally large and similarly shaped horns show that these purely aren't for fights between Diablos males to acquire territory and breeding rights. The reason for such horns and fights are universal across the genders, and that universal need is likely food. Black Diablos drive their own mates out after a successful mating and completely monopolise the area for themselves. This is because, as the world art book states, the dark coloration doesn't just stop after the estrus period, it continues to affect the Diablos through pregnancy as well. In spotted hyenas, high-ranking females in late-stage pregnancy produce more androgens that influence their offspring's development. The cubs of higher-ranking individuals are more aggressive and dominant, growing up to get better spots at kills and have more mating success. The same will likely be true of Diablos. The more androgens their mother produces in pregnancy will likely result in more aggressive young that will also grow larger horns and thus be better at carving out territories. Diablos likely lays eggs, and so she's probably supercharging them with androgens through the whole period as she can't give them a final big dump before hatching, like an animal that has live young could. Black Diablos are also a lot more powerful. In a lot of animals, darker colorations are associated with higher testosterone. And if Black Diablos spends several months a year on a testosterone binge, it's unsurprising this will cause the other benefits like greater musculature. The extent of this may be so great that Diablos cows, even without breath attacks or energetic defences, are considered to be on par with Elder Dragons through sheer physical strength alone. The black coloration also serves as a warning, and it's obviously useful for cows to clear out the nesting area of predators that may attack her young. 
A black Diablos is also one of the few animals a Devil Joe is genuinely frightened of, and any predator that doesn't retreat is given a zero tolerance policy on the continuation of its life. So what about Monoblos? Monoblos's array of horns may be impressive, but it's clearly not for fights between its own kind. The horns can't really interlock. Rather, Monoblos likely uses its headgear for display. This has been suggested for Ceratopsian dinosaurs without brow horns that can interlock that they are instead used to signal health and strength of the individual to preclude a costly and dangerous fight. This may also be why Monoblos has such a pronounced back crest too. It further exaggerates its profile and makes it look more intimidating. In a lot of modern mammals we see similar things, lateral displays where ungulates will engage in parallel marches to show off their body size to try and repel a competitor without a fight. But with the main signal of strength being in their front, Monoblos may rather have a head-on display, with two males bobbing and bowing to one another to show off their horns and frill with the lesser male backing down. If he doesn't, however, then it may be to the death. Fossils from Ceratopsians also suggest that without brow horns to interlock, they attacked each other's bodies instead. And with modern ungulates, tests of strength can often elevate to fights to the death. In two monoblos bulls that don't back down, they may well engage in a death match, using their horns to try and inflict a lethal strike on their opponent's throat or chest. The other primary reason may be to repel potential predators. Monoblos's broader and less specialised diet likely means they don't have to engage in muffs or the frequent shoving contests, due to the fact there's a lot more for them to eat overall. This likely frees up the headgear to be used to repel attackers, as if Monoblos lives in areas with more woody plants like arid savannas, as well as true deserts, this may result in more frequent interaction with predators in such environments. There are indeed fossil records of Triceratops using its horns and frill to fight off Tyrannosaurus, and it's pretty obvious a Monoblos's horn could do some real damage. The spiked frill also protects the Monoblos's neck, so Glavinus wouldn't be able to replicate its grab it manages on Diablos in their turf war nor would Devil Joe be efficiently able to get a proper hold on Monoblos' horn. Although with how Iceborne's turf wars were done, if Monoblos did arrive anytime soon, and imagine they're just copy and paste Diablos' turf wars right over with plenty of awkward clipping. Monoblos' upwards facing horn may also generate a more powerful upward strike, better using the nuchal ligament and neck muscles over Diablos, who has to snake its neck back for a weaker jab in close quarters. To review Blosswyvern's overall interactions with predators, it's fair to say that they're hostile. Be it bird, brute, or flying wyvern, even when not in muffs, either gender of either species of the giant desert wyverns will attack and kill other wyverns, even harmless ones like Barra. Whilst both species are too large and well armed for healthy adult individuals to have real predators, this is likely the Blosswyverns creating an environment to favour their offspring and future lineages by removing threats. There may not be a lot of room for brain left in their reinforced skulls, so it may be a case of anything shaped like a threat is attacked with maximum hostility. For animals like Baroth, this is just plain bad luck. It's unknown if Blosswyverns exhibit parental care. On one hand, the big you are in mammals, this results in it, but in reptiles like the sauropod dinosaurs, this may not be the case. In wyverns, there's not much info with this, with there only being data on a handful of species. It may be possible Bloss wyverns are somewhat like crocodiles in this regard, in that they guard eggs and their young until a certain age, but don't feed them or properly tend to them. It's more that they're born small and precocious, and live in their mother's shadow for protection. This may also be why Diablos has tusks as well. Considering they don't seem to play any real role in their adult life, Diablos chicks without their adult horns may eat things like roots and tubers in the desert soil, and use their tusks to help them root them out. Only when they leave their mother do they progress to cacti. Or maybe they're like little turtles, and as soon as they're born they're on their own. But this seems unlikely. Ceratopsian dinosaurs weren't hatched fully formed, and it's hard to imagine Blosswyverns hatching as perfect adult replicas. Even with their parents creating predator-reduced areas, hatchlings could be small enough to fall prey to just about anything. Hopefully we may get more info on this and general wyvern ecology as the series progresses. There is no doubt with their huge food demands and enormous tunnel systems, the Bloss wyverns have noticeable impacts on the environments they live in. Through changing the physical properties of the soil, they change how water filtrates through it, what plants may live there, and the nutrients in the direct area. Their creation of caverns and tunnels also creates unique habitats with their own microclimates that host or support a diverse array of large and small animals. This is what we've already found out from a burrowing animal like an aardvark. So the scale Diablos and Monoblos would also do it on would increase impacts a hundredfold. The Blosswyverns directly create the unique deserts of the known world of Monster Hunter. There's also the impact on vegetation. 
Modern giant mammals produce huge amounts of dung with huge amounts of seeds in them, and the Blosswivens are likely vital for numerous desert plants for their seed dispersal. Through browsing trees, monobloss also likely changes the composition of that tree. It creates and removes habitats. In elephants in our own world, this can be a serious conservation problem when we fence animals into limited areas. But prior to this, habitats almost performed like a Mexican wave. By destroying trees, an animal opens an area that changes the vegetation structure there. Animals dependent on trees move out, those dependent on scrub or open habitats move in. But dead trees are also a habitat in themselves, hosting a community of invertebrates that in turn can host potentially several generations of insectivores depending on the scale of the tree. Think the rotten veil, but writ small. Once the animal has moved on, regeneration occurs, but before it's complete, unique animals live in that transient habitat. Both destruction and regrowth are their own microclimates in nature. A final question could be why is monobloss seemingly rarer than diablos? The doilist answer to this would just be that Capcom prefer using Diablos in games as it can be hunted in multiplayer, but that's boring. For a Watsonian explanation, let's consider what Monobloss may mean in the cultures of the known world. In the original game, Monobloss horn was worth more than Diablos horn, and it's also potentially got some value to other cultures in the known world like that of the felines. Monobloss is also one of the few animals you actually carve the heart from too, and it's said to symbolise anger. It's also the only monster you have to kill singly. Overall, among many hunting cultures, it seems Monobloss is the true test, the beast that really makes you a genuine hunter. After all, it's not Rathalos that makes you the hero of Kotoko, it's Monobloss. As we've sadly discovered from our own world, when we place certain cultural values on animals, it leads to their decline through unlawful poaching. Hunters desperate to become recognised may try and take down monobloss without permission. Or illegal teams may hunt them and sell horns and hearts on the black market, for those unwilling for the challenge but overly keen for glory. In For Ultimate, it's said that monobloss was the monster that started the practice of refined monster hunting. The context behind this isn't really known, but it may be possible a guild was set up in part to try and prevent the unlawful killing of monobloss especially, and the ecological degradation that will happen without them. Unlawful hunting may also fail, and both Blosswivens are also said to have killed many amateurs attempting to bring them down. The gunner in Kotoko had his career ended by a crippling injury from the same monobloss that you later slay, that also laid low numerous other soldiers. Amateurs or poachers can fail to finish a job, and there's the famous story of the rogue elephant of the Abadares. It killed numerous people and raided multiple villages, and when finally shot, it was found a bullet had been lodged in the nerve centre of the tusk that contributed to its poor condition, as well as its aggression. It was likely a similarly ambitious fool that broke the horn of the Diablos that became known as Bloodbath. In the original Monster Hunter art book, it's described that there's a giant red Diablos that's the king of its kind and this may well have been the bloodbath individual prior to its wounding and the series of events that cost countless lives. So overall, what do I think to the horned duo? I love them. They're two of my favourite monsters in the entirety of the series. They have a fantastic design, they're great fights with great gear, and as giant herbivores it just adds that little bit extra flavour that grounds the monsters in the Monster Hunter universe. Like a handful of devout others, I do prefer Monoblos to Diablos, I just think he's that little bit cooler. Diablos I think is still great, and his implementation in Base World was also fantastic, with both the Turf Wars and the use of the Wildspire Waste environment in his fight. With the add-ons though, he got considerably crapper. I will quite happily die on the hill that his Turf War with Devil Joe is absolute nonsense. But even more insultingly, the fact that Black Diablos is thrown around by Anjanath is pretty disappointing. Whilst carnivores often kill each other at any opportunity to eliminate competition, they typically ignore giant herbivores. If all the large predators can just easily dunk on Diablos, it really ruins their prestige as the giant herbivores of the game. If pretty much anyone can now take down Black Diablos, how is it any different from it just being a big, angry Apsaros? I'm not saying they should win every fight, but at the same time... Come on, Anjanath. On this note, I'm also already envisioning Diablos getting bullied in Turf Wars in Rise. <sighs> the cooler Monobloss would never fail me like this. On that note as well, I do hope Monobloss comes back at some point in the future. It'd also be nice if they gave him his theme from the first game as a proper leitmotif whenever he's fought. With the next level graphics future consoles will have, it also gives them a good opportunity to redo his rage frill colours in a big way. 
It would be amazingly cool if he had badass war paint like designs from various paleo arts of Starachosaurus when enraged to really amp up the visuals of the fight. I'd also like to see the role monsters play in the native civilizations and their history discussed more, and as said earlier, Monobloss is a prime candidate for this. Thanks for watching, and thanks to everyone who put up last week with the clipped video dimensions. I didn't actually realise that until several days after I'd uploaded. I'll do a re-upload soon though. To everyone who's already subscribed, thank you especially. I really enjoyed everyone's comments last week, and if this channel ever gets massive, know that you're the OGs. And keep the suggestions coming too. As ever, please do share with friends and other hunters, like, and if you're a newcomer, please do consider subscribing too. I'll see you next time, and here's the teaser for it.